Hello, this is Peter Combs, bitamount.com, the eBay search site for mostly Asian antiques. We cover other things. And today is Tuesday, April uh, 21st, 2015. Today we're going to take a look back at the uh, newsletter this past from this past weekend. It was sent out Saturday night. And uh, as you know, the newsletter has in it things that our site pulls up during the week that look like they have promise, stores them, and then we build a newsletter for it during the week and send it out Saturday night. This is it. If you get it, you're all familiar with it. And uh, this week, I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of the blue and white that came up. We had a, found a lot of very good blue and white pieces, mostly uh, Ming to early Qing Dynasty. And uh, this fellow in particular jumped up at us. His, na his username is Hugh7873. It's his eBay handle. And uh, he doesn't sell a lot. He doesn't have that many listings, 260 feedbacks. But when he does, he has excellent things. And this week, he had a nice mix of early Japanese blue and white, which many of you know has been in a fortunate slump for the last 15 years. I'm sorry for the collectors out there that bought at the high on the market. But it's a good time to make up for it by buying a lot more because a ton of it's coming onto the market these days. And it will be gone eventually. But this plate is a Chinese plate that uh, this fellow put up. And I thought it was pretty terrific. Um, let's blow this up a little bit. He cataloged it in, the, in his listing as an 18th and 19th century plate. Very conservative dating on his part. This is, a, I think, a, a mid-18th century plate um, for a number of reasons, which I'll get into. And we'll go over this a little bit. First is this rim. You notice all the little blisters and fritting around the rim, and it turned a little brown in the kiln. And the color of the cobalt, and the way it's drawn, these washes of blue over the, over the clouds. Okay. All right. The artist in this case took uh, clouds and used it to frame the dragon, which is rising up out of the foaming surf. These were beautifully done rolling waves, and he's coiling around here. He's got five claws behind him and five out front as he reaches for the pearl, flaming pearl they call it. And there's this lovely, cute little carp coming up on the side. And uh, it's a nice bowl. It's a very nice package. It's very well framed and very well uh, executed all the way around. But it's a, it's a mid-18th century bowl, especially when you look at the back. This is not at all typical for a 19th century foot. The uh, center is a... Uh, uh, sort of a cream color, but then outside of the foot it goes to a very bluish tinge, um, which is m very typical of uh, 1750 to 1770 porcelains. It's a wonderful thing. And it brought a good price, even though it, uh, it had a few nicks and whatnot on it. It brought uh, $1968, which is, uh, which is good, a, a, good, a good number for these. All right. The next thing he had was this. It was a Kang Shi jar. Uh, it was 27 centimeters tall, and uh, not a huge one, but beautifully painted. It's got this uh, lotus uh, cartouche here that's filled with all kinds of interesting things. It's got these two fans sort of pancaked on top of one another. And then uh, up above, you have uh, jade books. You've got scrolls and scrolls. You've got a nice incense burner, a lot of nice little scholarly things. And at the bottom, he repeats it again. More books. A big jade jadao there with the acanthus leaves coming up in another bronze uh, uh, pot there. And then e between each of these, which they repeat all the way around, are these elegantly done sprays of flowers. It's just a beautifully done thing. This is a very classic Kang Shi jar. Note the uh, very dense, uh, hard, uh, smooth porcelain. And uh, Kang Shi porcelain, for some reason, always feels very hard to me. Very dense, like stone. It does have a line in it. This this jar had a few condition issues. Um, it's got it's got that. It's got a here's a crack I remember that was in the in the base, and it has a firing flaw on the foot up here. You see that right there. Um, that's not unusual on these though, because they were so hard, so tight. Sometimes they split. But the, what's interesting is 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 the the foot is just wonderfully done, very nicely done. When they when they when these were green and they were potting them, they would use different tools to smooth them over. And notice how the glaze just stops perfectly with next to this very stout foot, this nice thick foot. And uh, on the bottom, you have a little bit of uh, a few dimples and things from uh, air bubbles. But uh, overall, this is a nice pot, a good one. And uh, also notice how the shoulder goes up and slopes in slightly, sort of sinks to level to a nice level deck there. That's what you want to see. All right. And uh, what else did he have on here? 
Oh yes, this, the Carrick Bowl, uh, second half of the 16th century, and uh, beautifully done. Uh, let's blow this up. This is a very classic example. And it was a pretty good size, as I recall. Um, it was uh, 8 inches in diameter, which is a nice size for one of these. And there it is. Very classic interior to these. Very similar to, you know, the, what you see, the deck coloration of the Wan Lee piece. So you got these Tibetan flaming wheels on the interior. Uh, there's another shot of them. The bowl had a number of issues, though, condition-wise. You can notice there's a crack here. There's a crack here. I remember there were some chips on the uh, on the back of it, on the on the edge of the rim, and uh, but beautifully painted. And here's the foot. Okay, the all important foot. Uh, now you notice there's some chips and pulling in here. These occurred when the piece was made, in my opinion. The reason is that you have iron oxide lines, iron oxide areas showing up here, and uh, and here. And what that means is that these were exposed to the air while the piece was being fired. And as you can see, the glaze, for mo the most part, goes all the way up to the edge. But they missed it here and they missed it here. Something happened. Maybe some clay got knocked off or something. But when it was fired, you, you got this little resulting iron oxide line. All right. But overall, this is a charming bowl. And I thought it was quite lovely. And uh, there's these sort of uh, lotus tip leaf edging around the top. Very nicely done. With the, I love the horses. I love when they put horses on these. And again, you have the uh, the blue drawing and then washed in with uh, a lighter, lighter shades of cobalt. Very typical of the period. All right. And let's get back over here. See who else had things up this week. Um, ba, ba, ba. Uh, this fellow, Art Deco Cogenza, Coenza. Sort of an odd name. And... Uh, he sells a few things, but he doesn't handle a lot of Asian stuff. We had, I don't think we've seen him before. But he had these two plates that were quite nice. There was this antique Kangxi plate, um, which I liked. This one. And uh, it, had a lo it was done, like a, like a, like, again, like a lotus flower with these uh, panels coming out. Kangxi period, they did a very provincial version of this that many of you have seen. And the center is usually a swirling device or just flowers. And they don't they didn't fill it all in quite so intensely. It has a deep nice glossy glaze to it. And uh the horse and the archer and the swordsman on the horses. And again you see the outlining of the blue and then washed in very gently. And uh see if we can get the mark. There it is. That is not a Keng Shi mark, as you all know. That's a Chen Wa mark a Chen Ma mark. And uh, very typically turn up on Kang Shi pieces. But you can see how the bowl was molded. You can see all the molding that was done when this piece was when this piece was made. Beautifully done. There's a side view of the foot, nice and white, and very smooth, no doubt. And uh, it did fine. About three hundred sixty-five dollars. Not bad for a small dish. All right. And uh, we're going to go back over here. Oh, I wanted to talk about this. <coughs> Excuse me. These these are a set of paintings, and I don't know who Guzzi one nine six nine is. And I have to say, I feel a little bad for him because he had these fabulous paintings. And for some reason, they didn't get much attention. <coughs> they went for very little money. These were large pictures. These were 12 by 14 for the image size, not including the frames. They were framed. And the whole, the, each of them sold for about $330 a piece. One brought a little over 500 And this, these are 18th century paintings. Um, beautifully done. The quality and the detail in these, this, these were steel. I'm just going to say it. And uh, I don't know where the, the recipients of the newsletter were, but they missed this one. And uh, these are beautifully done. Spectacular quality. Uh, you notice here the, this sort of browning on the uh, flowers. That was the artist showing that the, the flowers were going a little past their peak. And uh, wanting to keep it all real, making it look very natural, he he tinged them in as though they were rotting a little bit. Same with the fruit. But just excellent quality all the way through. And I wanted to go back just a minute here. Where's the? There was one in particular that I thought was tremendous. I thought they were all very good. <coughs> but I loved this one with this exotic bird. Uh, I'm not a I'm not an ornithologist. I don't know what kind of bird this is. Some looks like almost like a parrot of some type, with that beak, the nut cracking beak. But uh, again, the artist uh, did a spe spectacular job with the flowers, 
take a good look at that. And he did a great job also showing again the decay of the plant as it's gone, it's going by its uh, peak. And the bird's uh, details of the feathers. This is a real top quality painting. Uh, every little, every little bit of the feathers were painted in all the way around. All right, and this was a steal for somebody. I had a very similar painting of this this genre that I bought, I think, 20 years ago, and I think I paid 1,500 for it then, and they've gone up. So whoever bought all of these for uh, next to nothing got a heck of a buy, and they were framed. Come with the frames. So you got to pay attention out there, folks, and. Uh, that's about it for the week. There were a lot of there were some nice jades. This fellow had a, a couple of number of good blue and white candies have turned up on the market lately. Here are our listings. I won't go over them because they haven't sold yet. And uh, each letter's got a link to the uh, website, and you can look at live a live uh, items there that are being sold. And uh, I think that's about it. So uh, if you uh, have any questions, send me an email. If you have uh, want to get the get our thoughts on something you have and you wonder how old it is or is it authentic let us know also you can reach us through the contact us part right up here in the corner and if you live in Europe or someplace else in the country we'd be happy to give you the name of a seller in your area that we know who can uh, best help you all right and if you're a regular uh, dealer friend of ours I hope this helps okay until next time, have a great week, and uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye.